only uh, the only question I still have is, um, did you utilize your GI Bill, and how did you use it? You didn't use it. Okay. I, uh, my younger brother utilized his. See, I, uh, I went to work at Delta Airlines. Uh, well, at first I thought I would uh, go with Ford Motor Company and I would have utilized my GI Bill some. But uh, then I went to work at Delta and uh, didn't, uh, didn't need it out there. And uh, my younger brother, uh, he used his. He, uh, well, he volunteered for the Navy. There's four boys in my family. We were, we were all in the Navy. And uh, my oldest brother, actually he was my half-brother, because his mother died right after he was born. Uh, he went through some pretty rough stuff. And uh, he was in uh, the more in the African area, I think, than anywhere else. I, I never did discuss it with him because he was pretty much a nervous wreck for quite a while there after the war. And uh, finally his nervous condition got okay. And then uh, the, the next brother, he was a pharmacist mate. Well, he was a pharmacist when he went into the Navy. And uh, he was in the European theater, but he was attached to the Army all the time he was in, except when he came back from Europe after D-Day. Uh, he went to the Pacific, but uh, I didn't know it until several years ago, but he's, he's, he doesn't discuss it. So evidently he got some pretty bad stuff over there. Uh, but as I say, he was a pharmacist mate, and uh, he drug out a lot of the dead and mutilated bodies, you know. And uh, then the younger brother, uh, he volunteered. He wanted to be a fighter pilot. That was in the summer of 42. Well, he's down at Jacksonville uh, taking his training. And he finished his boot camp training. And before you make your first liberty, you know, they give you shots. Well, out of the 75 boys in his platoon, they all came down with spinal meningitis after those shots. And uh, we know that 36 of them died. What happened to the rest of them, we don't know. But the doctors, it was, I think mom and daddy said there were six doctors in there. But anyhow, they says, he's gone. And uh, this nurse kept working with him. And uh, he lived, but left him deaf in one ear and damaged his other ear. And uh, other problems, they had, when they discharged him, they had to send a sailor home with him because he couldn't travel by himself. And they called him in for pension rating purposes, 10%, you know, 10% disability. And uh, then in the late 50s, he lost a hearing in his other ear, and he's been completely deaf ever since. And there's nothing known in medical science to do him to help him in any way. He can't hear thunder, he can't hear nothing. And uh, But I came through, never got a scratch other than that uh, dingy fever that I had there at Guadalcanal. That affected uh, your back? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've done pretty well today because I've been moving around. But now I can usually make about an hour, uh, like uh, Last night at church, it was rather long, and uh, I was hurting, hurting bad before it was over with. Uh, but as recently, well, I say recently, about it's been six, seven months ago, I was cleaning up some brush in my backyard, and uh, my feet got tangled up. I fell backwards. Only time in my life I reckon I ever fell, and but I hit flat on my back, and it jarred every vertebra in my back loose, I reckon. And uh, I'm having a lot of trouble from it. But uh, I live with it. I've lived with it since long about 1944. So no point in giving up now. But uh, the Navy uh, delivered me from any VA hospital. Uh, me and after World War II, were pretty much guinea pigs, the ones that could get in hospitals. Uh, 
it, as I told Dr. Daniel, the head doctor up at the VA office at Bell Isle Building, I said, Dr. Daniel, you people do something good for a guy every once in a while, and you smear it all over the newspapers, make the public think that we're getting the best treatment in the world. But as for you yourself, Dr. Daniel, I think you are a damn disgrace to the medical profession. So then he sent me down to psychiatrist. The psychiatrist said I had a grudge against the Navy. Well, there's nobody thinks any higher of the Navy than I do. Uh, I encouraged my, my wife's youngest son to go into the Navy doing Vietnam, which he served on an aircraft carrier in Vietnam, and got back okay. And uh, I encouraged my own son to go into the Navy. He stayed in about 12 years uh, and would have stayed on in, made a career out of it. But he, he couldn't make uh, another rate. He wanted to make chief. He'd been up for three consecutive years for chief uh, electronic technician. And there were no openings. So he told him the third time, says, if I don't make it this time, I'm out. And there were no openings, so he came out. And good thing for him, because uh, he's working out at CDC. Good job, good pay, five days a week, off Saturdays and Sundays, holidays. And uh, But deliver me, if I ever go to a VA hospital, I hope it's only to visit someone. And I really don't care to do that. However, since Vietnam, there was so much hell raising about the treatment of those boys that the, the VA hospitals have uh, improved considerably. Now, the, the shipmate up at uh, Whitesburg uh, said they're called in ever so often for reevaluation. And uh, I guess it's been about a year ago, they called him in to give him another eye. Well, you can look at him. You can't tell which eye is his good eye. I, I looked. I honestly, I couldn't tell. Uh, he's got shrapnel in him that I guess he'll die with. And uh, uh, over up at Duluth, uh, he's had a number of operations, and he's had good service. But, uh, well, and to the, the boy out at uh, Stone Mountain, Hardy, he died last October. Uh, he got good service, but it was so obvious on each one of them what their difficulty was. Because Hardy, he got shot up. Uh, Orr got shot up, or a shrapnel, you know, and busted up. And uh, Fred Franklin, he lost his eye besides shrapnel in him and all. So everything's obvious. And if you go in there with usually with a broken leg and they see it, they'll do something about it. However, I have seen some instances where one while I was out there, a guy comes in, he was all bent over sideways. He's in terrible shape. And uh, they look, well, the word was he was just putting on. But you know, when a, when a fella puts on in a case like that, sooner or later he slips up. And he didn't slip up. He was that way and couldn't help it, but they wasn't doing anything for him. And when when I tried to get in the hospital, they kept putting me off. And uh, finally, I did get in, and I got just exactly what I figured I would get, a run around. And as I say, vitamins in the daytime, sedatives at night, good food, and then they want to do exploratory. I says, I'm out. And, let me ask you a loaded question. I know we're going to the bottle in a minute. This really has, this almost sounds like a shrink question, but going back to the first part of the tape, running through your exploits, if you knew then what you know now, when you looked at that ad in the Atlanta Journal in 1941 to join the Navy. I'd go. I knew that was going to be an answer, but I had to ask. Sure. I tell you, in, in reality, I think that uh, a married person has more reason to join the military than a single boy or girl. Uh, 
because they've got usually their family or uh, for us single guys like myself, uh, I was just foot loose, fancy free. Uh, there was a chance for adventure and edu at that time you didn't know what war was. No, it I, could be uh, well I wasn't expecting war was at that time. Uh, what well, the only thing I was expecting was get into the Navy and travel the world. It, it was, as I said, a romantic adventure. Uh, the, the, the uniform, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, not inspired me, but uh, anyhow, when I lived in Rockmark before we moved to Dallas, I was under a teenager. There was a boy who used to come home on leave. He was a sailor. And I'd look at that uniform. And uh, that inspired me somewhat. But uh, later on, uh, in my teen years, I still had a desire to be a sailor. And I just wanted to be in the Navy. And uh, war didn't enter my mind, even after Japan hit us. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't planning on engaging the Japs in battles. Uh, I figured that we'd hang around on the East Coast, maybe around Panama Canal, protect it, you know. Stupid ideas. Uh, 21 years of age and the only thing uh, I'd been doing was just uh, having a good time. And, uh, but after you get into, uh, it only takes one battle and you wake up. You're a veteran. You, uh, you wake up too. Now, yeah. go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 go. I was gonna ask you, you said they were uh, trying to recruit Georgians, uh, Georgia mm -hmm. boys to go on the Atlanta. Do you know, have any idea how many guys from Georgia were on the Atlanta? No, not really. Uh, uh, let's see, there was uh, some 60, 70 guys in my platoon, but they weren't all from Georgia. No, I don't have uh, any idea. Uh, the newspapers have given the information that there was a, a, a lot of Georgia boys on there, but no, there weren't a lot of Georgia boys. There, there was a few of us on there. In fact, uh, I've got some pictures of them down there in my truck of the ones that went in at the time I went in. Okay. And, uh, Maybe we can take a look at those in a minute. Okay. Let's uh, go ahead. Okay, this is, uh, the ship had uh, eight gun turrets. We had three up forward, three back aft, and one on either side midship. Fortunately, I was assigned to gun turret number eight. I went into this gun turret just a day or two after uh, boarding the ship uh, in December of 41. That is number eight. The next one is number seven. The next one is number six. Now from number six forward was hit, destroyed, blown up, lots of shell hits. Then, approximately midship here, the engine room, A rear, two torpedoes tore into us there, almost blew us in half. But everything on top side was just a shambles. What was the other torpedo that didn't detonate? The torpedo that did not detonate hit up in this A rear. And it just stuck in the... It just stuck into the ship and uh, did not detonate. You're talking about fire control. Can you show us on this model where the fire control was? This, this was the, the radar and the fire control area as well as the forward battery up here. My birthing quarters was, 
me see. It was it was right along in this area, approximately. Best I remember it. See, so I was trying to think. Uh, yeah, it, it was somewhere, somewhere right along in, in this area. Just uh, just above the uh, water line, well, I was I was one deck down. Clifford, where the ship went down in Iron Bottom Sound, how, how deep? What was the depth of the water where the ship went down? Where the Atlanta is sitting is approximately 300 feet of water. And Robert Ballard. It's she's she's sitting water. on on a, what more or less referred to as a shelf, and. Uh, right out from that area, it gets real deep water. There are, they picked up or they sighted 12 other ships in that immediate area. And so Ballard has gone down on the Atlanta like he did the Bismarck and the Titanic. And yeah, they, uh, they took pictures and everything and she's, uh, she's just a rusted, oh. rusted hull. Yes, yeah, she was. She was a mighty ship. What was your uh, what? And looking back, what was your most memorable, or, or, or what was the best time you ever had while had enjoying duty on the ship? What What do you remember that sticks out in your mind? That, when we could make liberty in Honolulu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, we had uh, we had lived in Panama, but uh, that you just got your feet on the ground was about all. And uh, then we went ashore in Tonga Tabu, which was in the Tonga Islands. But uh, that was just merely getting your feet on ground. And so uh, the the only real liberty was in Honolulu. Work shifts on the uh, 0600 in the morning. You'd what have breakfast, or how long would you work on uh, each day? I don't remember the uh, the working hours and the watch hours. Uh, it was a routine uh, aboard that ship as well as uh, any other ship. Uh, after breakfast, uh, I always went to the turret, gun turret, because that was my job. Uh, as I said before, there's no swab index, uh, no KP duty, anything like that for a gun striker. You utilized all your time in taking care of that gun turret. And uh, you, had, you had certain hours that you were on uh, watch, uh, say like four hours you'd be on duty, you'd be right there at the gun. Uh, that was continuously around the clock. Uh, we'd be on watch for four hours, and I think it was was more or less four hours on, four hours off. I, it, it's hard to remember uh, all those details. Get asleep, you was there looking after the guns, because being at sea with the moisture and everything, you you continually had to keep the guns clean. I mean clean. Surprise attack. I mean, we on that type of. Oh no, we didn't have any. The only surprises. How much leeway, how much leeway would you have before you knew you were going to be engaged with the I really don't remember the time period there, but the night of the big battle, we only knew about the other ships just a, a very short time before it actually happened. Uh, I don't remember. But I, I know when he said condition red, it was only a, a matter of several minutes. Because I was standing there, turning around and around, shaking like a leaf, swinging my arms to steady myself. 
And, but then the moment I commenced firing a gun, well, then I was in good shape. Uh, these are some of the Georgians that were uh, on board the Atlanta when she uh, went down. Uh, in the top row, you see G.C. Gibson. Uh, he passed away uh, recently. R.T. Shaw, he lives up near Lake Chateaug. On the upper right-hand side is Fred Franklin. He lives up at Whitesburg, and uh, J.W. Davis, he lives down around Columbus, Georgia, and of course, myself, Clifford Dunaway, I live in Mara. Back down on the bottom line is L.C. Hardy. He passed away uh, about a year ago. He lived at Stone Mountain. C.M. Brannon, after, uh, well, he never did come back to the United States after the war, I believe. He uh, married a girl down in New Zealand and stayed there. And the rest of these fellas, I knew them, but I don't know what has happened to them. Uh, they were in and around Atlanta. They were Georgia guys, of course, but I, I don't know what, what has happened to them. One. All right. So this is the uh, commissioning program right here. Uh -huh. Top picture. And that's you right there. Yeah, well, there's two pictures of me there. This, this is an old scrapbook that's been... Is this a scrapbook you kept or...? No, a, a girlfriend uh, kept it for me and uh, gave it to me after I came home. That was our doctor. Just uh, kind of a, a modern question. Do you feel any uh, remorse about the fact that the current USS Atlanta, the, the fifth one, is being decommissioned? Do you, you feel any? I made a statement at the decommissioning here in Atlanta uh, for the submarine Atlanta that we should have another USS Atlanta and let it be a warship that uh, sails on the ocean, not under the ocean. Why is that? Just uh... Well, I think the, the name Atlanta 
should uh, live on in naval history. I got the impression that the uh, at that meeting that uh, something has been uh, is in the works for that. And my son served there on the Eisenhower, and uh, that come out of the uh, a little local paper, News Daily, I think it was. Get a, uh, let's get a shot of that page there. I don't know if it, it's got a date. Right up here at the top, I think it does. January 12, 1943. Yeah, yeah, okay. I knew it was in sometime in January. Well, that was almost... Uh, Two, two months later. Hmm. Now, when, did, when you got back, when did you get married? First, first time or last time? <laughs> <laughs> first time. Then we can talk about the second time. Uh, let's see. The first time. She came out. Forty-five. I believe it was in forty-seven. But it wasn't the I same see. girl that kept the scrapbook for you. No, oh, no, uh -uh. no. She met a guy down at Fort Gillum. She went to work out there, and uh, met a soldier out there, and wound up marrying him. Uh, she she was a fine girl. Mighty fine girl. Uh, let's see. I married second time in 63. And I'd been single for, let's see, 53. Yeah, it was about 47 when I married the first time, yeah. Because my, my daughter was born a little over a year later, and she was about, she had started school when we divorced. Now, what was the uh, the PT number that you were on, that you were I don't, I don't remember. remember. Uh, Okay, that's your PT boats. They were fine little boats. Uh, they were expendable, and uh, some of them, a few of them went down out there. Anyhow, that's that's where uh, I lived in Tulagi Harbor. Uh, we uh, on this end was our workshop. We had all of our ammo. And we had a little dock right there. And uh, but that was a very small island right there. Let's, in, let's bring it around here so I can. In, this picture is uh, Tulagi Harbor. That's where our PT boats were stationed uh, around different places within the harbor. There, uh, our PT boat tender was tied up underneath a bunch of mangrove trees. But this little island is where we had all of our ammo and. Uh, we had gasoline storage tanks for our PT boats. We had a little dock here because uh, we had to have that on account of the torpedoes. But we lived on this uh, little island for approximately a year while uh, we were stationed there in PT boats. This is where Kennedy's crew came into. 
Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's some of the officers standing in front of the uh, one of the shacks there. That one had some weaving on it, had some uh, walls to it. But most of them were just uh, V-shaped uh, roofs on them with the sides. Well, the, the sides was about this high and uh, they was, you know, just open. They just had a, a roof on them was all. You could, uh, mine was right on the, the edge of the water. In fact, I could lay in my bunk when the high tide was in and I could reach down and wiggle my fingers in the water. And this is some of the guys that were in the PT boat, so old, old Ski, remember him real well. And that's, I think, when they come back to the States and got some medals. I think that's all on, on that. But I just, just a little something this, uh, on PT boats. Yeah, my crew was lost there at Guadalcanal because they went out without me. And uh, then I swapped with a boy for D-Day and that crew was lost. And at Guadalcanal, one of my shipmates off of Atlanta, he lives up here in Chester, South Carolina. Uh, I guess I've credited him with partly saving me from that, uh, going out that night. Because I was I was down on uh, the other end of on the lower end of the island, and I found out that my crew was going out, so I had no transportation, and they didn't send after me, and I was running up through there to catch this boat that had uh, for some unknown reason stopped at our dock. You won't have to go out tonight because you was on patrol last night. I said, well, I better go, go see. And about that time, the coxswain started backing away from the dock. I went running out there waving at him, but he didn't see me. He sold out. Well, there I was left. My crew went on out, and uh, they were all lost except one motor machinist mate. 